All right. Hello to everybody out there in Facebook land. It is now 10 o'clock Eastern time and nine o'clock Central time. We'll give you guys a little bit of time to uh, log on or, or to, to, to come on board. See a few people tagging in. For those of you who are not aware, the, the country is in a pandemic right now, but not just the country, but also the, the entire world. This coronavirus has really shaken up everything from, uh, from economics to people's personal lives to, fi to finances uh, to retail. Everything is really affected by this virus. And I'm sure that many of you are affected as well. They're, you're probably working from home. You're with your kids all the time. That the, Your kids' schools are now shut down. And so everyone is just affected by this. And over the last few weeks, I have been eavesdropping on my wife and sister's uh, conversations about this. And there's been some questions that I've been curious to ask, wanting to ask. And so I've thought about picking up the phone and calling and asking a couple of times. And I thought, I'm just going to bring all you guys in as well. Um, now, Ashley's sister, Brittany, is is uh, who I've been wanting to talk to. She is actually a surgeon at UAB in Birmingham, Alabama. And, and so I'm just going to rapid fire some questions at her, some questions that you've probably been asking and looking for answers to, questions that you've You've asked your brother's cousin's best friend through a text message that he heard five states over. And so maybe hopefully this will bring some calm, peace uh, into your minds and make us more aware of what we're really, really dealing with. And so also, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them um, to list them and we will try to get to it uh, toward the end. And so, but Brittany, thank you so much for uh, joining me this evening. You're welcome. And um, hello, everybody. This is my first time to do a Facebook Live. And um, I, I definitely wish it wasn't under these circumstances. Um, I will start with a little bit of a disclaimer. And, and that is that, like Donnie mentioned, I am a surgeon. So I am not an infectious disease doctor or an infectious disease specialist. Um, I specialize in taking care of um, hernias and um, patients who have reflux. Um, but I do have medical training and, um, and I also am colleagues with some really great um, infectious disease physicians that I trust um, implicitly. And that's where I've gotten a lot of my information from where I'm making decisions for my family. So I hope to share some of the wisdom um, and knowledge that I've gained. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, if you don't mind, how, how long have you been in the, the medical practice? So I have been um, out of training and in practice for four years, almost almost through with my fourth year uh, of practice. So um, I did a uh, you know four years of medical school, a five-year general surgery residency, and then a one-year um, advanced GI minimally invasive surgery um, fellowship. So um, it's been a while since I graduated from college. Um, and I'm in, yeah, like I said, my fourth year of practice. So I've actually been in Birmingham at UAB, um, for 10 years now. Now, which is crazy. Oh, wow. Do, do you have any interesting stories from your time there? Um, yes, of course. Um, it's funny because when you're in training, the interesting stories are kind of the crazy um, traumas or strange pathology. Um, and then you kind of get into your niche practice and the interesting stories are more like these really wild, complex hernias, which are, you know, just openings in the muscles of the abdominal wall. Um, and some people don't think that that's very exciting, um, but it's pretty exciting to a hernia surgeon. Um, and so my stories are not, the stories that I think are cool are not usually that cool to other people. Um, you have to be a hernia surgeon to really appreciate my stories <laughs> in some way. Um, so the, 
it is a fun profession because um, at least I love what I do because I improve people's quality of life every day. Um, and that is really meaningful. Um, some people really get a lot of joy out of curing cancer or saving somebody's life kind of acutely whenever they're dying in front of you. Um, but I really enjoy meeting a patient, them having a serious problem that is impacting their life on a daily basis and being able to offer them a repair, usually through small incisions, because I'm a minimally invasive surgeon, um, that makes their life better. So it's, um, it's a fun profession. It's intense. Um, you have intense relationships with your patients um, because surgery is very nerve wracking. And so that is, um, that's why I love it. That's cool. I, I have to pause and give a certain two-year-old a hug, a night-night hug. You want to say hi? Yeah. Hi. Hey, buddy. Mm-hmm. Hi. Right. Okay. No. I'm sorry, but that was very important. <laughs> Absolutely. That That is the most important thing right there. I love that. I love that. That is... Uh, it's my buddy Hudson. He's awesome. All right, so let's let's talk about this coronavirus thing. Uh, mm-hmm. That well, everybody's talking about it. The experts are talking about it. The non-experts are talking about it. The people who think that they're ec- experts are talking about it. And um, and what I really would like to do is just to hear you know a medical perspective, and I think that everybody else wants that too. Is be, just be hearing from somebody who deals with the medical field who whenever you see massive uh, n- news articles come out and they have a bunch of words in there that nobody understands mm-hmm. um, just to be able to kind of understand those things. So from a 30,000 foot perspective, what is COVID-19? Sure. Do you think about, so I don't necessarily want to compare it to the normal flu because it's, it's not the flu. Mm-hmm. Um, or it's not, it's not the same as the flu. But if you think about how every year, whenever you get a flu shot or when it becomes flu season, just the regular old flu, people talk about the different strains of the flu and how, whether or not the vaccine is going to work this year and, and things like that. So viruses are always kind of evolving, um, or mutating and becoming either less strong or more stronger, et cetera. So, um, this is a virus that um, probably originated in an animal population and then had some other vector to get to humans, like another animal more than likely, at least from what my, my understanding of it is. Um, and so it through mutations or et cetera, um, became a virus that could infect humans. And it's, um, there are other coronaviruses that are out there. Um, and so this is in that same family, but it's novel or new because it's, a, um, you know, because of the, its makeup. Um, and it is um, very contagious. And, you know, what makes it really kind of unique is that it, um, Patients or people who become infected with it often take quite some time to come, become very ill or show symptoms. And so during that whole time, that kind of latent period, whenever they're infected but not symptomatic, they are going to be out and about and doing their normal things and therefore sharing the virus with a lot of other people. Um, so that is why it's been such a big deal. You know, Everybody always says, if you feel ill, stay home. And that is great advice. But in in a lot of ways, it's almost too late if you're staying home at that point. You've already infected or shared your virus with many others. So, and, you know, it's a lot different than some of the kind of more recent um, epidemics that have have happened, like um, SARS and et cetera, and, and, my understanding is that it's a lot different because those patients would get really ill a lot faster. Um, and so you were able to quickly identify if they had the disease and then they did not share it um, with other people as quickly or as it wasn't as easy to share it. So, or maybe, maybe a better way to say it was easier to isolate them quicker. Um, 
So um, that that is why it has been so difficult to contain. Now, you're talking about containment, and one of the things that uh, we've heard a lot of is this this term, flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that that's something that's been said a lot. And for me, it was to see that the chart uh, that was going around, that was a massive eye opener for me. So do you mind just kind of sharing flatten the curve? What does that mean? And, Mm -hmm. um, and, and like within the comparison between uh, staffing and hospital availability versus sickness and all of the stuff that kind of goes into that term flatten the curve. Yeah. So um, a lot of people are taking comfort in the fact that only a small percentage of patients appear to get really ill with this disease. Um, And that is indeed, to some extent, comforting. But because of how how quickly it's spread and how many people are becoming infected and how a lot of people are infected but asymptomatic and therefore sharing and sharing, there's concern that um, even the, the percentage of people who get really ill um, and require a lot of hospital um, support and medical support, um, that is still such a great number if, if it continues to spread as quickly as it had has, that it will overwhelm the hospital systems. And that's certainly been the case in Italy. Um, and then, you know, China had a amount of really serious and significant response to be able to handle um, the illness there. So they set up temporary hospitals, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And then it's kind of a little bit of a perfect storm um, at some places or really across most of the United States in that um, we depend upon manufacturing in China for a lot of our equipment, personal protective equipment. Um, which is how you protect healthcare workers from getting the disease themselves, um, or even out in the community, how you might protect yourself from the disease. And so we're facing supply chain crises where we need more supplies. Um, we need more shipments of supplies coming in, um, not only to handle a surge of patients from the disease, but just our normal operations um, because it's been going on long enough in China and shut down manufacturing long enough in China um, that it's, it's just the perfect storm. We are going to need a lot of, of supplies to take care of these patients and we can't get access to those supplies. Um, so that's what has healthcare workers so concerned. Um, and certainly, if you run the math on who is getting, um, or you run the, the numbers of who's getting infected and the percentages of people who are gonna need ICU and ventilator support, the reality is we don't have enough ICU beds and ventilators if the illness is as bad in the United States as it has been in Italy. So um, there, there are some like glimmers of hope in that our population in the United States is younger than the, the average age is younger than the um, Italian population. So potentially we won't be affected as badly, um, but it is difficult um, to completely be comforted by that because um, there's certainly plenty of other kind of models that show that we will be quite overwhelmed. So going back to your question of flattening the curve. So if a certain number of people, if we quickly spread this infection um, and, you know, the 2% of patients that need hospitalization and ICU ventilators, if that the pe- number of people infected, that small percentage, if there's any way that we can slow down the spread of it so that the uh, pe- percentage of people who need ventilator support is kind of over a slower and longer drawn out time, um, then hopefully we won't overwhelm our resources as, as badly. Gotcha. Yeah. That was the thing that kind of convinced me to, uh, was it social distancing and, and really focus on social distancing? Yeah. Um, I actually 
heard something, I think it was either today or yesterday, but people are starting to say physical distancing because you can still be involved socially, just like I'm in Alabama and you're in New York. This is ultimate physical distancing, but we're still connected socially. Um, so I thought that was a little bit um, interesting way to put it because we, we are more interconnected than ever before. Um, this is certainly an example of how we're very global because it has quickly spread um, around the United States. I mean, around the entire world. So, Absolutely. And um, now if people are at home and they think, I have read all the symptoms and I think I may have this, what should they do? So you should not go to your doctor's office. Um, you can contact your doctor's office and um, and let them know of your concern. And then it depends kind of on where you're at, what you what exactly you need to get tested. Um, but there are drive-through testing centers or um, different labs that you can get tested at. And so the idea of not going to your doctor's office and sitting in the waiting room is that you, again, you don't want to spread it to other people. So you want to get kind of as close to this testing center as possible and then contact them on the phone um, or online or et cetera through whatever method they have. And they will basically come to you in personal protective equipment um, and do a swab. And then um, usually can notify you of the results within like 48 hours. Some, some places are much quicker than that. Sometimes it takes longer than that. And during that time, whenever you are um, waiting to hear, you should completely quarantine yourself. Um, so, of course, anybody that you've had close contact with that may have already got the virus, um, you would try to limit your contact with them and then no new contact with anyone. Um, and that is if you feel ill but don't have any, like, red flag symptoms. So those um, red flag symptoms would really primarily be significant shortness of breath um, and in that case, you know, you need to go to the, the nearest emergency department. Um, and the, you know, what, what we're hearing um, from other physicians who are already treating these patients um, in large numbers is that you can kind of quickly go from um, shortness of breath and difficulty breathing to, to needing additional support. So you would want to get help. You wouldn't want to wait too long to get help. Now, on the flip side of that, what kind of advice would you give to people who are, who say, you know, I'm healthy, I'm good, I can just go about my everyday life, and because and I'm young enough to be able to fight off whatever I have. What would you say of that person? Yeah, so you're you're probably young enough to. The odds are in your favor, um, but the, but it's not down to zero, um, so it's not a guarantee that a young uh, person will survive this disease by any means. Um, although the odds are certainly in your favor. Um, every year, thousands of people die from regular flu, and some of those patients that die from the regular flu are, are young and healthy and athletes. Um, so it's, it is definitely something not to, to take lightly and to something to respect. And then you also want to be responsible for the fact that, or, and think about the fact that um, you could spread it to other people who are more, more vulnerable. And sometimes those people don't necessarily look like they're ill. So they may be immunosuppressed because they're on a medication to control their rheumatoid arthritis or their inflammatory bowel disease um, or treating a, a pediatric cancer or something like that. It's not, they don't always look ill. They don't always have hair loss. Um, and so it really is about being a good citizen and, um, protecting the vulnerable that are around us. And that kind of led into my next question is everybody wants to kind of expedite the end of this thing. Nobody wants it to drag on. Nobody wants it to, um, continue for as long, as long as it could. So yeah. what, what can the everyday person just do to expedite the end? Yeah. So, um, that those are that's a tough question. So this has gone on for a long time in China. You know, China just yesterday or, or I guess into today, for the first time had no new reported um, cases. So this has been going on for a very long time. So unfortunately, 
it looks like it could be very similar for us um, and maybe even worse because we haven't taken as extreme measures as they have. Um, there are other things that might work in our favor, but like I said before, it's it's hard to, there's some glimmers of hope, but it's really hard to, to see a large ray of hope. <laughs> um, sure. So we might be in this for the long call. Um, so things that, you know, things that would work to turn this around is if we can get a good vaccine. Um, and then some of our crisis here is with supplies and personal protective equipment and et cetera. So it would be great if, or even ventilators, you know, it'd be great if we could mobilize some people to do more manufacturing, to think creatively and critically about, um, how we can, you know, take advantage of kind of the unique challenges of this time to be innovative so I know those are like big and grand things sure. to kind of talk about, um, but it it's true, it can help. And then, you know, the little simple things that we all can do is, you know, wash our hands, physical distance, no more than three feet, preferably six feet apart, um, and, you know, avoid any sort of crowded place, um, don't touch your face, cough, sneeze into your elbow. Um, I've become a real ninja with my elbows this these past couple of weeks. Like I walk into the hospital and I try not to touch anything with my hands. It's all my elbows. Um, so the, you know, that's when you come home, you, I um, leave my shoes downstairs. I walk upstairs. I don't touch anything. I get into the shower put all my clothes from the hospital into a, into the wash. Um, so just kind of being very, very mindful about that, um, taking care of our neighbors, um, and the, and watching out for the vulnerable among us, um, I think is an important thing to do. So, um, in these times of crisis, it can be very anxiety provoking. And so it's a good time to, um, fight anxiety by looking out for those around you. Um, and like turning inward as well and, and, um, focusing on, um, biblical promises, all those sorts of things. Um, so I, you know, I really am starting to feel like we may be in this for the long haul. Um, and that's not just my feeling. That's the feeling of, of a lot of medical professionals. And so, um, looking for ways that we can cope in the midst of all of this and kind of settling into this different season. Um, and then, you know, all working together to um, be wise about this and, um, and hopefully we will, we will come through and see the end on the other side. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, spending some time with all of us this evening and letting us ease eavesdrop in on your thoughts about yeah. about this critical issue uh, thanks for sharing your insight and your heart on it and um, yeah and thank you to everybody in on Facebook for tuning in tonight um, we've got kids that should be in bed and so we're gonna <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and so do yeah. you so good luck with all that and no uh, we're good here I, I will say that you know this is this is this like the scientific side of me is really it's really interested in this because it is this new thing that we're, there's so much new to learn about this. So in some ways, you know, this conversation is going to be outdated in like two sure. to three days. Sure. Um, so I think another thing I would encourage is to um, don't overcheck the news um, or overcheck social media, but find a good dependable source that you can trust and um, and that has reliable information there. They need to be citing like scientific journals and things like that and, and kind of keep yourself up to date because it is a rapidly evolving and changing. So of course the CDC and the world health organization are pretty good um, sources that you can depend on. Um, I, I do want to ask one question here. Sure. Um, what do you consider is, quote unquote, the long haul 
three months, six months, or has anybody said anything like that that you've read or heard? Um, so I've heard all the way into like 18 months. Um, you know, I think we're all kind of operating in this like idea that we're going to be home for the next two weeks. Um, and that the further we get into those two weeks, I think the more we see that stretching out. So, you know, all of my elective cases have been canceled um, initially for two weeks. Now it's for four, you know, so um, there's certainly some people that are concerned that we're going to see, you know, we're going to flatten the curve maybe a little bit, and then we're going to start feeling a little more comfortable. We're going to get out, start mingling more, start gathering in large groups again. And then, it's going to spike again in the winter and um, it hit us really hard again then. Um, so the ways to mitigate that would be vaccines. Um, there's certainly several therapies that are under investigation for this. Um, so that have gotten, you know, FDA exceptions um, to that are hopeful that we're very hopeful about. So the, um, that could potentially shorten some of this. So, and I, I have time to take other questions. I can certainly, um, surgeons are definitely known for having opinions, so I can certainly try to answer them. All right, if you do test positive, how would you recommend being quarantined in your home with your own family who may have also been exposed? So they're definitely exposed, yes. Um, and they all should be quarantined as well. So um, your you need to stay within your home or yard. Um, and if you need supplies, then you need grocery delivery or contact your local church. I bet Westchester Church would be happy to leave some groceries on their front porch. Absolutely. Um, and, um, and then you need to notify um, anybody around you that you may have come into contact with so that they can also self quarantine and, um, and watch for warning signs that they may have the illness as well. And that's a, that right now is at a 14 day quarantine. Um, if you come in contact with somebody that has coronavirus and then you are able to get tested, um, and it's negative, then you can take yourself off quarantine. Um, but you certainly can get infected by somebody else in the future. I was scrolling through questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can't if, see any of the questions, so you'll have to put me all in. Yeah, if, if, if you all, if you guys knew the setup that we had here to be able to pull this off, it would be a major. <laughs> we are definitely being creative tonight. But Brittany, thank you so much for your time. I, I asked you for 30 minutes and, and, Thank you so much for 30 minutes of so much great information. If anybody else has any questions, um, hold on one second. I want to get this one in here if I can see more. Well, okay. what would you say to people, particularly medical professionals, that are still not really taking the situation seriously? This is coming from someone who's in the medical profession and they said they're seeing way too much of that. Not taking the situation seriously. Um, what should we do? So, I mean, um, Pray the, harder. <laughs> <laughs> the situation. Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, finding a common ground is a great way or common goal, um, like establishing that and then seeing if you can kind of talk them around or, or um, share some information um, would probably be the ideal way to go about that. Um, you know, I initially wasn't super concerned. Um, I, you know, I traveled outside of the country recently and um, Stephanie, one of Ashley and I's sisters, it was like, I don't know how I feel about you leaving the country. And at that point, the, you know, the death count wasn't very high. Um, and we didn't, we had only seen maybe one or two cases in the United States. And so I was like, you know, the seasonal flu is probably more dangerous um, at this point. 
Um, but I started hearing concern from a lot of people that I trust, um, and, and people who are smarter than me that I have, uh, I'm able to come in contact with and, um, certainly started following the numbers and, and et cetera. And, and some people are very motivated by information and scientific studies or et cetera. Um, other people are motivated by different things. So there's a video, um, going around of, you know, an, a newspaper in Italy, the obituary section in January versus like the obituary section now. And it's just pages and pages and pages. Um, so look for, you know, kind of different things like that that you could potentially share, um, that could be, could be helpful, um, or open people's eyes. So like you said, it wasn't until you saw the graph with the flattening the, the curve that you kind of realized why extreme measures were needed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, once again, thank you so much for your time this evening and thank you to everybody. If you have any questions for Brittany, um, you can just send them to me in a, in Facebook messenger and I'll send them to you and we'll try to, uh, get you a response because this people have questions and like she just said, she's connected to people who have answers and she's got some pretty great answers herself. And so once again, thank you all for joining in and y'all have a good night and, um, uh, don't drive your families too crazy in your state of quarantine. Good night, Brittany. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.